When a house is sold, local councils issue a 149 certificate informing potential buyers of a property's history. This might include structural damage or extensions to the house, but for around 1,800 properties in Lake Macquarie, it will also include a lead warning. Bullaroo real estate agent Kevin McKenney found out about the new inclusion when a building society refused to lend his client money. It was on Friday, there was a, a loan application rejected uh, from a building society um, because of the information from the valuer to say that uh, he considered the, the property to be of high risk um, on information that he had received from Lake Macquarie Council. What Mr McKenney objected to was the phrase lead contamination used in the 149 certificate. It's a word. It reminds me of the skull and crossbones. Lake Macquarie Council agrees. Today it changed the wording. It now reads, this property may be affected by lead levels exceeding the level for further investigation as recommended by the National Health and Medical Research Council. It also goes on to say further investigation should be carried out. What is also of a concern to Mr McKenney is the area the warning applies to. It includes all of Argentan and Bullaroo and parts of Glendale, Macquarie, and Spears Point. Well, we've um, done it to the whole survey area that um, the State Health Department looked at through the University of uh, Newcastle and it's a general um, area I think about two kilometres north and south of the uh, smelter. Some of the houses included by council did record levels of lead in the survey not regarded as a concern. Jodie McKay, NBN News. In these economic times, it's hard to bite the bullet and enter into a new business, but Tony Kemp is used to toughness. For the past four years, all his football earnings have gone to repay a mammoth $70,000 New Zealand legal bill, which he incurred in 1989 in winning the right to play for the Knights in the Winfield Cup. After having uh, no money for the first four years and finally uh, playing for some money this year, um, I've decided to tie it up in, uh, in a business in Newcastle with uh, opening up the KR today. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's good to have uh, open your wallet up these days and uh, have a couple of dollars in there. An automatic choice in first grade, either at five eighth or centre, Kemp has had his share of brilliant games, none better than the two try effort last Sunday. Taking a breather after a bigger than Ben Hur battle has held Tony Butterfield a car designed for speedy backs, Kemp confirmed his commitment to the Steel City. I'm very happy with the town, uh, the people have taken care of me very well here, the football team's uh, an excellent football team and, and uh, this year's probably our, our best year ever and uh, the, the best thing that will top it off for me this year uh, with Newcastle is bringing home the Winfield Cup. But Kemp was quick to point out there is still plenty of work to do to shore up a semi-final berth. The boys are on a high at the moment and the, and the good win against Penrith was uh, a semi-final game for the lot of us. Uh, beating Cronulla one step closer to, to that dream and uh, I hope we can all do it on, on, the, on the weekend. And for the rumour mill, what was Manly's Kiwi international Kevin Iro doing at today's launch of Spot On Motors? We've been best mates for a lot of, lot of years and, and it's very pleasing for me to have him just a couple of hours down the highway. Uh, I don't know, you know, Kevin Iro possibly might be here in a couple of years' time. Taylor in the blue shirt has been in brilliant form of late and on the eve of his departure for England in the World Championships he promptly disposed of Dennis Dalton in the semi-finals 31-11 while his opponent Rex Johnston was equally devastating thrashing former champion Steve Cox 31-10. Johnston got out to lead 16-10 after 18 ends before Taylor began his fight back and this unbelievable draw shot signalled his newfound dominance. Taylor grabbed two threes in a row to lead and later snatched a four and a three to run out the winner 31-23. At the Curry Bowling Club the final day of the Hunter Valley High School's championship had a win for Rutherford High in the blue who defeated Mount View High 23-10 in the fours final. The team of Lisa Parsons, Ross Cleary, Paul Cousins and Danny Lucas were always in command and ran away with the final. All players again emphasised the tremendous talents in junior ranks.
West, Lakes and South have already sewn up their spot in this year's semi-finals, but the battle for fourth and fifth is on in earnest. Curry is three points clear in fourth place, and then Waratah, Toronto, Maitland Central, and even North Nelson Bay are all in with a chance. But this weekend's matches could decide the issue, and for the 1990 Premier's Waratah, a win over last year's champions Toronto will see them in the semis. If we can win this game, I think we've got ourselves a semi-final spot. If Toronto wins, well, they might be lucky and get there. They've got a hard game the last one, but definitely a crucial game. A lot of people had written off the cheaters, but a midweek win over Lakes has altered that opinion. A lot of people wrote us off and didn't give us a chance, but I thought the way we played against Curry the week before, that we were, if we could stick to the way we played then, that we could knock them off, and that's just the way things panned out. Maitland are in there scrapping, but up against the Jones Boys South Newcastle Lions, it is a big challenge. For Souths, second place is up for grabs. We can't really worry about anyone else except Maitland tomorrow, and they're equal fifth with our two. Tomorrow is all guns blazing for us. There has been plenty shown, written and said in the past five days about the Knights' win over Penrith. And one player who deserves his fair share of the accolades is David Boyd. Forced to the front row to replace the suspended Paul Harrigan, Boyd was a tower of strength and only a smidgen behind Mark Sargent in the Man of the Match awards. I've been pretty happy with my form. Um, once again, it's just the way it really panned out. It'd be nice to know when you're actually going to have that, uh, that great game. But uh, yeah, it was certainly probably one of the best ones I've had for the club. But the war horse has been around rugby league for too long to become complacent. Boyd knows there are five games to go and the Knights must continue to win to make the semis. The Sharks are a danger. Last week they upset Illawarra and in the past three weeks have played brilliant football. And for Boyd, footy at this time of year is as much mental as physical. Obviously they're not semi-final contenders, we are. Uh, they've got everything to gain, um, nothing to lose and, and we've got everything to lose really. If you know we do, do take them easy, be a bit complacent, we'll, we'll, they've certainly have got the guns to knock us off so everybody's got to be on their game to, to get the two points. Around 70 first, second and third year trainees from all over New South Wales have been involved in a week of golf throughout the Newcastle region, fulfilling a major part of their strict tournament schedule. A trainees course lasts three years. The first year player must complete 40 rounds at an average of no more than seven and a half shots over par. The second year trainee the same number of rounds, but at no more than 5.7 shots over par per round. For final year trainees like Jason Ferreria of Marrickville in Sydney, it's a bit tougher. 40 rounds with four at even par, three at two over and three at three over. Belmont, Tanilba Bay, Hawks Nest, Murray and Merriweather have hosted the young pros as well as hundreds of hackers hoping to pick up a tip or two. One player with the odd bit of pressure to succeed, Paul Riley, brother of Australian Open champion Wayne and on today's form he could be a star of the future. One of the bandits was caught by a security camera this morning as he was robbing the state bank in Adamstown. While customers looked on, the man casually handed over a note demanding money and warning he had a weapon. This is the fifth robbery of this type in the region in the last fortnight. We believe that all the uh, hold-ups are related to the same group of people. Police investigations confirmed another two men were waiting outside the bank this morning in a getaway car. Just hours later another heist at the Greater Newcastle in Hamilton and then within minutes another attempted robbery at the ANZ Bank at New Lambton. Two weeks ago the Commonwealth at Hamilton was hit, days later another bank in Gosford. Tonight police have called for any public help. The group's leader is 182 centimetres tall, he has a short skinhead haircut and a chain tattoo on his left wrist. He may be dangerous. So if somebody should see this person, they should be careful. They should be very careful, not approach them, but uh, take whatever details they can and contact police straight away.
The famous trotter of the 1970s knew something was afoot today as old friends gathered for an extra pat and birthday ration of carrots. Bob Austin took on Flash as a two-year-old and along with Frank Murphy as Strapper, raced the stallion to 53 wins and more seconds and thirds than anyone kept track of. He was a horse. I didn't think he was his equal. Flash must seem like one of the family. He is one of the family. He's the Lord and Master family. We would like to sell out here, but we can't go because we've got him with us. Bob never bet on Flash. The prize winnings alone were enough to buy the family farm near Maitland. But it was Bob's turn to hand out the prizes today, and didn't the birthday boy love it? These students are putting into practice what until now they've only learnt from textbooks in Japanese classrooms. Here at the Language Training Centre at New England Uni, students can learn a little about Australia's geography and culture while they practice the language. They're actually going to do 28 hours of English here at the Language Training Centre, particularly focusing on spoken and uh, listening to Australian English. But the course isn't all work. One of the most expensive sports in Japan is golf. While Australians may take their vast open spaces and golf courses for granted, these students don't. John Whiteman is coaching them at Armadale Golf Club. Yeah, a couple of these kids really do uh, show a lot of potential. Some of them are just sort of starting off in the golf, but some of them really do. Particularly uh, one girl, she's an uh, excellent player. On weekends, students take part in competitive and social matches at clubs in the New England and North Coast areas. The education program was developed by both the Language Training Centre and the Tourism Development Authority. It's a pilot venture and similar programs combining sport and English tuition are planned for next year. Jane Anderson, NBN News. About 18 high-powered offshore racers tackled the physically gruelling ocean racing classic. The boats cleared heavy fog in Sydney to be greeted by blue skies and blue waters all the way to Newcastle. Early leader through the heads was Mover, but the field quickly spread out, each vessel hammering across the wave peaks at speeds in excess of 100 kilometres an hour. On the return trip, it was Stefan and Jaeger who led all the way, covering the 220 kilometres in just under two hours to take first place. For the amateur A-grade riders, ahead of them are gruelling 173 kilometres, starting and finishing at Wyong and taking in breathtaking scenery at Yarramalong, up the infamous Bumble Hill over to Peets Ridge and Calga, then down to Mooney Mooney, where they turned and headed for home. Four riders made the initial break, and soon after two of that group attacked, and that was the order of the day. The marauding pack couldn't haul them in, and with the finish line in sight, David Wells sniffed victory, and his sprint was too strong for Robert Stephen of Penrith, and Wells from Hunter District was the winner. At the International Hockey Centre Broad Meadow this week, the Australian Under-16 Hockey Championships are being played with some of the finest talent in the land on show. Each state is represented and for the next four days they will compete in a round-robin event. On Saturday the finals will be played with the grand final at 12.30.
There are more than 3,000 orchids in this exhibition. Years of painstaking care has been put into every bloom. Growers from all over Australia and overseas have jumped at the chance to show off their handiwork. We have flowers here from all over the world, from some of the best growers in Australia. Quite a lot of flowers from New Zealand and uh, the US. Despite the international competition, the Morissette and Lakes District Orchid Society won the Grand Champion display title. This magnificent specimen from Robertson Orchids was named Grand Champion, just one of hundreds of species on display. We've got many, many Australian natives. There are flowers from India, from all over Asia, flowers from South America, flowers from North America, flowers from South Africa. Next year organisers are hoping to attract more Asian growers and predict the exhibition will only get bigger and better. The latest allocation of state funds is up by more than $11 million on last year. The Far North Coast grants covering the shires of Lismore, Kyogle, Casino and Tweed have been divided into two sections. Each shire has been set aside funding for state and regional roads. Money allocated to Lismore Shire exceeds $2 million, with funds for the Tweed Shire and the Richmond River areas also sizeable amounts. Included in the roads to be upgraded is the kyogle Mwillumbar stretch. Half a million dollars allocated under the government's One Nation plan will see the road completely... Another step toward a sealed link between Kyogle and the Gold Coast. Councils across the region are planning their maintenance program for the current financial year, with further road grants, including 3x3 construction funds, expected to be announced when budget figures are released. The start for the 500 kilometre rally was at Coffs Harbour's Park Plaza. The New Zealand driver Possum Bourne, the first of almost 70 competitors, flagged away. The first stage, a frantic 550 metre dash around the shopping centre car park. None of the drivers wanting to seem anything less than spectacular. Championship leader Rob Herridge having to cope with an added distraction. Perhaps his charade driver Bob Nickel and Wayne Bell in a Hyundai Lantra continued their battle for supremacy in the front wheel drive class. Local Coffs Harbour driver Martin Quinn in a Mazda 323 showed why he is ranked as one of Australia's fastest. On the dusty forest track south of Coffs Harbour, Bourne's 400 horsepower Subaru Turbo was blasting through the stadium, the Kiwi steadily increasing his lead. On his local roads, Martin Quinn had the Mazda 16 seconds behind Bourne when he broke a rear drive shaft. Him 20 minutes to get mobile again, putting him virtually out of contention. Quinn's problems moved Canberra's Neil Bates in a Toyota Celica up to second place so far, almost 20 seconds down on Bourne and only two seconds ahead of former local banana grower Wayne Hoy in a four wheel drive Nissan GTIR. Herridge is obviously not on the limit, aiming for the consistency which has given him the championship lead. The rally continues tonight with a further seven stages tomorrow. And it's all thumbs up from the drivers who are competing in the Formula K Cup as well as road testing their machines. Around $140,000 has already been spent upgrading the circuit under the watchful eye of the Confederation of Australia Motorsports with another $60,000 to be spent before the world titles. CAMS are the principal organisers of the first ever World Championship Go-Kart Series in Australia. And it's the first time that Formula A cars have tested the new track, with drivers pleased with the 1,050 metre circuit, which is double the length of the former track. Today's time trials were encouraging, with Lismore hotshot Richard McLeod, now under the guidance of former World Formula One champion Alan Jones, setting the pace. Adam Clark from the Hunter Valley, a fourth place finisher in the World Cup in Japan, was another to signal he's in with a big chance for this weekend's Formula K Cup.
car buffs from around Australia have converged on Cessnock this weekend for the Newcastle Vintage Car Club's 10th annual swap meet. It's a chance to buy and sell spare parts not readily available on the shop shelf. What may seem junk to some is the car enthusiast pot of gold. There's pistons, assorted engine parts, various bikes, even foot fuel only into cars, a touch of nostalgia with oil industry memorabilia. The Falcons had a good win over Hobart in Tamworth on Wednesday and the Kings beat the Gold Coast. Harvey opened well for Newcastle. There's no love lost between these two teams and it was tough going under the basket, Dozier proving his fitness. Michael Johnson combined with Chris Steele for another two points and the Falcons look pretty good. With Steele in everything, relishing his time on court. But the Kings powered away in the end to win by five points. With a ball somewhere in size between a tennis ball and a soccer ball, and tactics quite similar to basketball, you have handball, a game that is huge in Europe and steadily gaining support here in Australia. This weekend in Coffs Harbour, the annual interstate series between Queensland and New South Wales in the under-18 and under-21 years divisions. The under-18 boys final was a beauty, with the lead swapping on numerous occasions, but in the end it was a win for the boys north of the border, 13 goals to 9. The doors of Tookley Ambulance Station were thrown open to the local media today. Ambulance officers said the aim was to correct misconceptions about the service which they claim are undermining public trust. They believe that many people are choosing to take injured or ill people to hospital in their own vehicles, unaware that modern ambulance officers are more specialised and highly trained than ever before. Advanced life support officers can do just that little bit more than an ambulance officer. They can stabilise the patient who is in a multiple car accident, give them fluids to keep their blood pressure up and stabilise them better so that when they get to hospital they're in a better condition. There are six ambulance stations on the central coast. Paramedics are based at Gosford and Bateau Bay, but all stations have advanced life support officers able to provide emergency treatment by ambulance within minutes. They're more or less a mobile hospital. They can do just about anything a hospital can do. So there's more important to get an ambulance to the scene than get that patient in the back of a bus or a car to the hospital. By anyone's standards, this is a big show called What Time Is Love. It's a story of a prophet, how his followers adore and hate him. 120 students from St Xavier's College at Hamilton have put their hearts and souls into an eight-minute performance. We began the first uh, week of school this year with auditions. Then every Wednesday, Sundays, evening rehearsals. They'll compete tomorrow night with 14 other schools in the state finals at the Rock of Stedford for a chance at the national competition. Amongst the 10,000 people expected to see the show, 700 fans from Newcastle supporting the young performers. Still on schools, students at Cardiff put their wares on show today in a special expo. Not unlike the expos in Spain and Brisbane, the Cardiff High Expo is a smorgasbord of the quality work of the locals. From dance and craft work to the special links forged between different races and cultures. The wind veered to the west-northwest at 140 kilometres an hour at about 10.30 last night. Trees and TV aerials snapped under the blast. One house at New Lambton was hit by a falling gum tree. 
Power lines throughout the Hunter were brought down. Shortland electricity crews are still battling gusty conditions to restore services in some areas. A grain storage shed at Cardiff was badly damaged. Its roof <laughs> out. Emergency crews came to the aid of residents throughout the region, clearing downed lines and tree branches. The Nobby signal station recorded the peak gust last night, but wind speeds neared 100 kilometres now throughout the day. An ill win for some was fun for others. Paul Watson from Tanilba Bay found it just right to fly his kite. Or was it the other way around? I guess when you're quite into kite flying like I am, you tend to um, not think of it so much of a, as a leisure activity, but more as a sort of an adventure, I guess. Um, uh, Thanks, Paul. Have a nice flight. <laughs> Andrew Lobb reporting for NBN News. Six PM, Tuesday, the twelfth of August. The Tower Cinema in Newcastle is hit by terrorists. Police say the attack had an uncanny resemblance to a raid near Buckingham Palace. It's Harrison Ford's latest blockbuster, Patriot Games. The superstar couldn't be in Newcastle for the opening night, but the bad guys came along, taking some theatre-goers for a ride. The drama was all courtesy of the Newcastle Police Rescue Squad, showing it has the skills to match anything in Hollywood. It looked like something out of close encounters of the third kind. They were the lights which lit up the Lambton Swimming Centre, but the globes weren't strong enough to penetrate the water, so now they light up the fairway at the golf practice range. Twenty after dark swingers can practice at any one time. It'll be lights out at 10pm. Lord Mayor John McNaughton was probably hoping for a blackout. Night golf won't cost any more, but staff say it'll be more pleasant golfers won't be able to see the garbage dump which surrounds the range. Anthony Griffiths, NBN News. Wharf Road was cordoned off. Brigades from Carrington, Newcastle and Hamilton converged on the row of warehouses which belong to the Maritime Services Board. Now abandoned, the sheds have provided shelter for the homeless. Authorities say the cause of today's blaze, an open fire left unattended in a disused office. A group of youths fled the building but returned to fight the fire with an extinguisher borrowed from a Salvation Army drop-in centre. It was that bad, we couldn't see inside there, so I basically said to them, look, let's get out of here, the fire brigade will go after this, and I bundled them all out. Firemen donned breathing apparatus and within half an hour had the blaze under control. As things calmed down, the former tenants returned. We lost our clothes, our dog, our blankets, our pillows, there's nothing much we can do. The damaged warehouse will be boarded up, no charges will be laid. Anthony Griffiths, NBN News. And you have to go back to 1985 for Curry's last appearance in a semi-final round, one that ended as quickly as it started for the proud Coalfields Club, which has produced no fewer than 10 homebred internationals. Next season they will be coached by former St Georgian Knight star Steve Lanane, who will be an integral part of Curry's lineup tomorrow. Already the flashy 5'8 is feeling the pressure. I've noticed the pressure um, since I agreed to terms two weeks ago, so... You know, just being there, there is a lot more pressure. But it's something you release anyway. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm looking forward to next year and the next couple of weeks, hopefully, to steer Curry into a grand final. Their opponents know what it's like to win the big one, 1990 being a vintage year for the Cheetahs. However, a new-look side has taken a while to mould, but it will be formidable. The 
the older fellas to lead the way for the young fellas, and uh, they'll be all looking forward to that. Plus, I'm looking forward for a big one tomorrow, a real big one. And Curry will be treating Waratah with utmost respect. Waratah gave us a bit of a hiding about three weeks ago, 18 nil on a Friday night. So you know, we're looking for looking to turn that around. On Sunday, Lakes will host South Newcastle in the qualifying final at Carl Oval. Front and centre, they're a disciplined lot. That's because many of these youngsters were troublemakers in the Chinese New Territory city of Sha Tin. Muck-ups who'd had a brush with the law, not that you'd know it. The group was put together by the Royal Hong Kong Police, and this is their most ambitious outing yet. They've slept under the stars in the Watikins and at Dungog, hiked through the Aussie bush and picked up a few tips about the wildlife along the way. Dingo. Dingo. I like hiking and camping. The scouts are being hosted by Newcastle district families and have a busy itinerary lined up for their stay. On the list, a day with surf lifesavers at the beach, abseiling at Mount Sugarloaf and a little sightseeing. Redhead in the maroon and yellow shirts attacked from the opening whistle. Their persistence was rewarded in the 10th minute with a Chad Mansley goal. Redhead maintained the pressure on Hillview's goalie, with Adrian Gillies finally breaching a gap to slam home the Newcastle side's second goal. Hillview came out a rejuvenated side in the second half and was unlucky not to convert attacking raids into goals. Redhead finally found their first half enthusiasm and turned the game in their favour, resulting in a goal from Martin Dunn and a place in the semi-finals. <laughs> 